There we go. Um, session is being recorded. Uh, so it, it will be made available on our league website uh, for later viewing along with the presentation. Uh, once again, I'm Mike Sir. I'm the executive director of the league. And uh, thank you for joining us today on, the, on this important issue. And uh, I'd like to thank uh, our, our speakers here today uh, for, for uh, offering their time to, to provide this important resources and, time, to, and their time um, uh, for your benefit. Uh, a few housekeeping issues, like I mentioned, it is being recorded. Uh, I would ask that everyone uh, remain muted. Uh, I think we've all we've all been on Zoom meetings, and this is being run on the Zoom platform where uh, we probably heard some information in the background of someone's conversation that we didn't need to know. Um, so if, if you could keep yourself muted unless you're speaking, uh, that, that, that would be helpful. If you have questions, you can drop them in the box. Uh, Sierra Bradley, the league's research associate, um, is is going to monitor the box and 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 handle any questions and uh, send the questions your uh, your way uh, at, or to to the speakers at the end. Uh, this session is for municipal leadership teams, health officials, and emergency response leaders to learn best practices and resources available to engage with and resolve encampments of unsheltered persons to exit homelessness and to enter permanent housing. Uh, we are joined, and I thank uh, Mike Callahan, who is the director of the Office of uh, Homelessness Prevention, uh, as well as Thaisa Kelly, who is the CEO of Monarch Housing, and Pamela Baker from the Collaborative Support su uh, Support Program of New Jersey. Uh, this will provide an understanding of national best practices for engaging and resolving encampments, advise of the state and federal resources available to assist and provide an understanding of the components of a dedicated response team, cadences of engagement, operational considerations to end concentrations of unsheltered homelessness. So with that, I am going to pass the baton uh, first to Mike Callahan from the... Uh... Mike, are you there? Oh, oh yeah, awesome. All right, thanks so much, Mike. Yeah. I appreciate it. From the, uh, Mike is the director of the Office of Homelessness Prevention. Uh, so Mike... The, the floor is yours. Awesome. Thanks so much today. Um, thanks so much, Mike. And thanks for, thanks for having us here. Right. Uh, really excited to continue to engage, right, with our municipal partners around this, um, particularly post the grant pa grants passed the Supreme Court decision. Right. Um, importantly, throughout the state, we really are at an inflection moment, right, where um, we can not only lean in to addressing the increase in unsheltered homelessness in our in our communities, but most importantly, um, come together and collaborate around um, that unsheltered homelessness to rapidly end it. Right. Uh, so importantly, right. Uh, so Janelle unfortunately had a co conflict and would not and will not be able to join us. Right. So I will be offering our opening remarks. Um, you know, and as Mike ran down, right, we have Teddy Kelly, CEO of Monarch Housing Associates, and then Pam Baker, right, from Collaborative Support Programs in New Jersey. Um, so importantly, right, our agenda as far as running through, right, is uh, I'll be handling the Introduction to Compassionate en Encampment Resolution, right? Um, this is a national best practice framework, um, particularly that we'd like to leverage our um, vendors and also to our grant base, our grant um, funded community-based organizations to really lean into. And there's really two key partners, right, um, that a lot of municipalities either are under-engaged with or not engaged with at all, right? Um, importantly, uh, Taisa Kelly, right, was going to be going over that key partnership and giving an overview not only of the continuum of care and what it is in each region in the state of New Jersey, but importantly, um, giving a really, really brief overview of uh, homelessness services, especially because kind of the Argo of uh, the Argo and secret language of homelessness and housing can sometimes be a little obstructive, right, to thinking about and operationalizing services. Similarly, when we go over the compassion engagement framework, um, one of the things that we're going to be talking about and working through as we kind of look look at what an ideal workflow looks like, right, is the idea of a lead outreach agency. 
Um, and so collaborative support programs of New Jersey, right, uh, led by whose team is led by Pam with with regards to the homelessness division within that organization um, is oftentimes uh, utilized not only by us here at the department, but also to many municipalities that are in doing this work and doing it really well as the lead outreach agency. Um, also importantly, right, uh, the CSBNJ receives funding for this work along with a couple of other organizations throughout the state. And we'll be sending out to the leaks and follow on materials um, so that everybody knows the things that we're talked about that we're talking about, but also to other items within the slide deck. All right. So moving on, right? So when we talk about encampment resolution, we're really talking about a coordinated multi-system strategy in order to rapidly identify encampments or large ag aggregations, meaning more than three people, right, of persons experiencing unsheltered homelessness in a given area and to and to get them into permanent housing as rapidly as possible, right? Importantly, this is a housing first strategy. This is not a hotel first strategy, right? Um, as you see with many of the folks experiencing unsheltered homelessness throughout the state, right, there has been some point in their journey of either unsheltered homelessness or sheltered homelessness, right, where they have either been involved with the shelter system or the or the emergency hotel voucher system. And for whatever reason, right, that hasn't led to an exit to permanent housing, right? And so when we talk about this coordinated multi-system strategy, it's incredibly important that the end state that everybody is working towards collaboratively is that everyone who is living in unsheltered conditions together in an encampment is exited to permanent housing as rapidly as possible, right? And that really is the focus, right? And, and kind of when we talk about what the desired end state is and what the task of what you're doing, what you're doing when you're doing this multi-system coordinated strategy and you're operationalizing it is connecting residents to housing is what leads and more importantly is what lets you do narrative management, but also to ensure that you're you're in the moral high ground where you're saying, no, we are not exiting, we are not destroying where these people are currently living. We are getting and we are accelerating their placement and exit to permanent housing so they no longer have to um, live in unsheltered conditions. One of the um, things that we I always like to say is a point of, of alignment, regardless of political valence, is that if you find unsheltered homelessness unacceptable in, in your community, that's where you start from. And that is a great point to, to lead from, right? Um, importantly, the approach that we're going to go over with encampment resolution, it's, it's evidence-based practices. But more importantly, it's evidence-based practices in a multi-stakeholder environment, right? And similarly, when we talk about the purpose or your end, you, in the end state, right, the whole reason why this framework exists is to avoid re-encampment and also to unnecessary trauma that is all, that is often experienced by people who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness in encampments because you are destroying a community or there has been no notice and there has been no collaboration or planning or deliberative process by which to end that unsheltered homelessness, right? So importantly, right, um, when we look about workflow and we want to visualize this, right, um, this workflow itself is one that we leverage with CSPNJ and some of our continuums across the state, right? Um, it is a best practice uh, utilized by the United States Interagency Council on Homelessness and um, the University of California, uh, San Francisco, right, which is one of the leading kind of, which is one of the thought leaders around engagement and resolution of unsheltered homelessness. And we're really talking about five steps, right? So identification, assessment, planning, drawdown, and follow-up, right? Um, and there's actions in each step and importantly teams that, that you build along the way, right, to in, in order to effectuate that outcome. Um, Importantly, when we talk about each step along the way, the actions are really tied to what you need to be doing, but they are not an endpoint, right? So just as you engage in a prioritization tool, if you have multiple, if you have multiple encampments in your municipality, right, as you work towards developing your by name list and assess the needs of each household, that continues and then feeds into daily case conferencing, which continues and feeds into moving residents inside and full site mitigation, which continues and, and moves into preventing re-encampment, right? Um, so the first kind of key, if, key, key, key um, step with the identification is you really want to formulate your core strategy team, right? And so the key members of your core strategy team are continuum of care leadership, most often the executive committee, housing providers, air outreach lead, property owners, law enforcement, right, and public health officials. 
right? Um, many folks on this call may not be familiar with the continuums of care, and that's why we've leveraged um, and, and invited our partner Monarch here, who is who provides um, not not only consulting services to the COCs, but uh, but also to other services around homelessness planning to all the continuums in the state. Right. And so this core strategy team, the responsibilities for this team, right, is resource allocation and problem solving. Right. The operations that they're going to undertake are daily case conferencing and the that cadence and frequency. Right. Uh, uh, frequency. Right. If you're doing this every single day. Right. And you're meeting for an hour in order to engage and purposely operationalize the strategies to, to engage and, and resolve an encampment. Right. You're going to be able to rapidly move through move through that encampment resolution process. Right. If for whatever reason, staffing considerations or other things require a, a less frequent cadence of meetings, say a weekly cadence, right? That's when you really see that encampment resolution time get pushed out to the right, right, by quite a few weeks, right? And so the focus, right, of the identification phase is really removing the barriers to housing from the perspective of a systems level by having the right partners at the table in order to make that happen. Right. And so with that first phase, there's prioritization. And so the purpose of prioritization is when you have to strategically allocate limited resources. And most often this happens where there's more than one encampment in a community. Right. And a good example of this is in many municipalities in the state of New Jersey. Right. This in, engaging in this type of coordinated effort will be the first time that they that they try and try and take a bite of this apple. Right. Um, one of the one of the key points of failure along the beginning of the process. Right. Is to try to simultaneously engage with every encampment, engage in, in a municipality all at once. Right. Um, There's really not a national best practice. And we've seen a lot of efforts in New Jersey, particularly right where folks have bit off way more they can chew and they haven't built the business business and governmental processes that are incumbent upon that core strategy team when they haven't been built along along the way. There's been some failures. So there is a prioritization tool that we can share with you afterwards around that, but it really is key, key domains, right? So if you have more than one encampment, right, as you work towards that collaborative pro planning process to in, in resolve that encampment, right, you want to take in, into consideration the following, right? Population needs, right? Any 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 disorder that's happening, so any public any public safety issues that are happening, public health location or geographic geographic targeting when we talk about geographic targeting we're of course thinking about climate and also to the winter right there may be some areas right which are going to be more heavily exposed to the elements where if you have to pick between one or two encampments right there is one there might be one that has more of a threat to life person and limb right and that's where you want to go and want to go and engage with there's considerations in that process particularly hazard protocols for high risk sites right so um, coming from a harm reduction uh, reduction approach, right? There, there may be there may be some substance use. There may be some other issues, right? Which you might have to think about and uh, add to your core strategy team. And importantly, right? There may you may have to leverage public health protocols or your existing public health, public health infrastructure within the municipality for infestations, for example, bed bugs or infectious diseases, uh, for example, hepatitis, right? And also, too importantly, right, um, in some encampments, especially the larger encampments, right, there is no large waste mitigation strategy, right? Oftentimes, that you may, may be experiencing where folks, right, there's urination or defecation in a haphazard way, which may expose certain persons, right? Um, similarly, one of the things that we like to caution here, right, is that the prioritization information that a core strategy team is using should be kept confidential, right? Um, as everything that we talk about here, right, one of the really most most salient points of failure, right, is socializing everything and everything with the press and folks that have no need to know and have no business not being read in on things, right? Um, importantly, right, many of the conversations around around homelessness are not only have to do with uh, PII, right, so personal information that's protected, but also to, in, in some cases, HIPAA protected information, right. And the goal, again, with prioritization is to address the underlying resource constraints and to still make movement, right. So when you move into the assessment phase, right, one of the key hallmarks and one of, one of the things that you're going to need to achieve is to develop a by name list of residents. And in order to happen with that, right, you're going to have to contract with a really great with a really great lead outreach agency, right, or have, have them leave the effort, but also too importantly, right, also partner with your local continuum of care, right? Um, and this is gonna allow you to importantly address the housing related needs of, of each household, but also any adjacent needs. Similarly, right, 
through the assessment phase and the by name list is you generate assess an assessment uh, and a census for an encampment. This allows you to close the by name list to new additions, right? One of the things one of the things that we're going to continually talk about here, right, is the appointment of an end date, and that that end date is widely socialized with the residents of the in the encampment to make sure that not only are they being actively coached and engaged and partnered with to help end their unsheltered homelessness, but that but that the municipality with within its responsibilities as as, as an echelon of government are going in for or not only enforcing the law, right, but ensuring a safe a safe and um, healthy space for everyone. Right. Similarly, one of the things that you might want to think about and bake into the assessment process, and my office can partner with you, and so can Monarch, um, right, is conducting an equity assessment if needed. Right. Um, in many, in many, in in many encampments, right, many of the folks that are living living in encampments and in, and in shelter conditions, right, are doing so because they have found a community of choice and have created a family of choice. And many times that's because they either have an identity construct, for example, LGBTQIA plus. Or right, they might have some other facet of their identity, or health, or or racial background, right, or gender background, or they might be survivors of domestic violence. There is something right which might necessarily you have to bake into that assessment process that is that honors that, and that will actually help you more expeditiously exit folks to housing, right. And as you lean into that assessment phase, move into the planning and action phase, right, we this is where you really need the daily case conferencing, not only with the strategy team, but with the housing team, right? And the key deliverable here is to develop housing stabilization and service plans for each household. And another key deliverable is to notify residents of an encampment closure date, right? Um, one of the worst things that you can do, right, is have the rumor mill go between Right, folks experiencing unsheltered homelessness and outreach workers, and making and not and not ensuring that everybody who's working in this space collaboratively to end and resolve that encampment and to end the homelessness that exists there, right, is if no everyone is not clear on one the desired end state, which is permanent housing for all the residents experiencing in, in sheltered homelessness, but two that the date by which right the encampment will be resolved and closed, right. Similarly, within the planning and action phase, right, that is the key, that is the key phase, and maybe one, one week, and maybe three weeks, right, where you address the legal and documentation issues, particularly right, as, as Pam will attest to uncover, right, quite a few people experiencing unsheltered homelessness do not have their birth certificate, they do not have their social security card, they do not have other documents which they may need to produce in order to, in order to enter into more permanent housing programs. Right, um, that that identification and the resolution pathway, right, really happens during that phase. And then the next phase is the drawdown, right? And this is when residents begin moving into housing placements, right? Um, optimally, right, you're coordinating moves over several days or several weeks, right? And after that, and because right, the site has been posted and the, and there's been socialization of the end date, conducting a sole full site mitigation only happens after final move out. And, and the outreach routine withdraws once the last resident departs. And this is really key and important too, because this also lets your public health workers, it lets your DPW know, it lets your law enforcement folks know that, hey, everyone has exited this, this encampment, right? They've been given ample opportunity to do so, and hopefully they have, they have all to avail themselves of services. But simultaneously, any additional items, anything's le left behind, right, are things that have been consciously discarded, right, versus unconsciously, or they're a property that hasn't, that, that hasn't been taken account, of, that, that no accountability can be traced to. Um, Right. And then lastly, follow up prevention within this phase. Right. So one of the things that we really are trying to enforce with our municipal partners is after you work through that la the rehousing phase, you have to prevent the reencampment. Right. Through re regular monitoring. Right. And oftentimes and this is not oftentimes your, your lead outreach agency this is oftentimes your public health officials, your law enforcement folks, your fire department folks, your code enforcement folks. Right. Engaging in regular monitoring. Right. Um, similarly, you might want to consider as a municipality after going through this exercise once creative and pro social solutions for site activation. Um, you want to maintain connections with former residents for support right to ensure that that re encampment or that risk doesn't happen. Um, and importantly too, one of the other things is that is that in any encampment right it's a community right and a lot of those and, and a lot of those community bonds right should not necessarily be severed as they were not only sustaining of someone's unsheltered experience right but there may be friendships and other things which evolve from there which could help be protective factors against future homelessness and then lastly is everything right we ask all of our communities anybody that we're working with in evaluating the process and outcomes for future iterations and improvement and things to go 
and things to go from there. So with that, right, i uh, happy to pass it over to talk about one of the key partners, right, to Taisa Kelly, CEO of Monarch Housing. Hi, everyone. Good afternoon. Happy to be here talking a little bit about ways that you can partner with your continuum of care. Uh, you're going to hear me refer to them as COC, but continuum of care to really end unsheltered homelessness and, and address un encampments in your community. Next slide. So just a little bit of background about Monarch. We are a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1990. Um, with the vision that every person will have quality, affordable, and permanent housing. And so we work to achieve that vision through um, expanding the supply, accessibility, and a uh, variety of affordable housing and permanent housing through development, planning, advocacy, and partnership. So within our agency, we have two teams. We have a housing development team that focuses on working with developers to create affordable and supportive housing throughout the state. And then we also have our homeless planning team, which works with communities both at the county level, at the municipal level, and at the agency level, um, working with partners to really develop and implement plans to end homelessness uh, that are really geared toward getting people into housing as quickly as possible. And as an agency, we truly believe that housing is a human right. Uh, so all of the work that we do kind of emanates from that perspective. Next slide. Within our homeless planning work, just a little bit more information about what Monarch does. We do work with uh, the continuums of care. There are 16 continuums of care in the state of New Jersey, and we work with all of them in some form or fashion. Uh, we work with 14 of the 16 on their continuum of care application process, which is a funding application uh, for services and supports within their community to address homelessness. We work with all of our systems on, or all of the continuums in some form around system planning, developing strategic plans and homelessness, monitoring their systems and reviewing things. We conduct data analysis and coordinate the annual statewide point in time count for New Jersey, um, preparing those reports and getting that information out and also doing uh, county level, program level and community level system analysis of what's going on uh, with folks who are experiencing homelessness and whose data is entered into the homeless management information system. And then finally, we work with communities and providers uh, to help develop innovative programs to address specific needs that might arise uh, this includes things like creating housing first programs. We've worked with communities on creating programs that are targeting high frequency users of hospital services, other types of programs. And so as part of this, also this question around encampment and how to help folks who are in unsheltered encampments get connected to housing. Next slide. So I'm going to go into what the continuum of care is just to give you a little bit of perspective. As Mike mentioned, the continuum of care is one of the key partners that you really want to have at the table. Um, as you're looking at how you are addressing unsheltered homelessness in your community. Um, just as a little bit of background, the continuum of care is both a plan itself. So there's a continuum of care plan, but it's also a planning process that includes a lot of partners that are really organize, coming together to figure out how to organize and deliver services more effectively to increase housing stability, to support those who are experiencing homelessness or who are at risk of homelessness. So their charge is to promote a community-wide goal of ending homelessness they are responsible for providing funding, for organizing and coordinating the funding for the system. The continuum of care does not control all of the funding that goes towards homelessness in a community, but they do have control over some pieces of the funding and help to create the protocols and the um, requirements for agencies to most effectively support people who are experiencing homelessness or at risk of homelessness. Uh, they also work to coordinate and uh, promote access to resources, ensuring people are connected to mainstream resources and are utilizing all of the different services that are available, as well as working to ensure that the families that are experiencing, families and individuals that are experiencing homelessness, both sheltered and unsheltered, um, are given the opportunity to, uh, to really optimize their self-sufficiency. Next slide. So within the continuum of care, as I mentioned, it is a planning process there's a group of folks that are meeting on a regular basis to really assess what needs to happen in the community and to figure out how to improve the, the services that are available and access to services. So um, here's like a sampling of the different types of partners that are around the continuum of care table. Typically for New Jersey, most of our continuums of care are led by county government, but you've got local government that is involved in the continuum of care planning process. You've got nonprofit providers, service providers, advocates, Hospitals, business, law enforcement, each group looks a little bit different depending on the community in which partners have been engaged. Um, and then there's also uh, been a movement and 
in most communities, there is a group of an advisory board of people who have previously or might be currently experiencing homelessness uh, that are there as part of the conversation to help really inform the strategies that are implemented to make sure that they are going to be effective in, in the way that they are administered. So the planning structure for those continuums of care Just hold on one second, folks. I think uh, I think Thais uh, just lost. I think she'll be hopping back on in one second. Yes, I wasn't sure if that was uh, on that end or this end. Sorry about that. I am back. <laughs> um, so as I was mentioning, um, the continuum of care planning process, uh, each continuum has an executive committee, full membership committee, and then the subcommittees that they have really are the spaces where a lot of the strategy is developed uh, and those subcommittees can be organized by issue or population. For example, some uh, continuums of care have subcommittees that are focused on issues such as permanent housing, helping people access permanent housing, or uh, coordinated entry, figuring out how to coordinate the services within the system, discharge planning. So there are some subcommittees that are issue-based, and then there are other subcommittees that are population-based. Uh, some continuums have, for example, a veterans committee, which is focused on addressing veterans homelessness or youth homelessness, um, really understanding that the needs of each particular population might be unique and that those committees need to come up with strategies that specifically speak to the needs of that particular population. Most continuums meet on a monthly or bi-monthly time frame. There are some continuums that have quarterly meetings, but they're typically meeting on a regular basis. Uh, subcommittees and executive committees are typically meeting monthly or bi-monthly to address these issues because there's a constant need to really stay on top of what's going on. And the charge of the continuum, some of what they're really doing is one, assessing the need, uh, developing and implementing strategies to address the needs of people experiencing homelessness, applying for funding that is both uh, directed by the continuum, but also coordinating funding that comes into the community to address homelessness. Um, as part of that, they are really working to develop strategic partnerships with any partner, any stakeholder that might really have an impact on homelessness and help support people as they exit into permanent housing with the goal of really building a system uh, and monitoring the progress of these efforts and retooling as they needed uh, if they're seeing emerging needs come up or if they're seeing that the strategies that they've looked to implement are not really reaching the targets that they originally intended. Next slide. So part of what the continuum is trying to do is to build an effective system plan. Just as a little bit of background, homeless services, you know, as we know it today, really kind of grew out of a response to a housing crisis and so what we had was lots of different programs popping up, emerging to address a particular need in communities. Um, as things evolved over the years, there was a recognition that we really need to have a systemic approach to addressing homelessness if, if we're going to really end homelessness. And so a lot of what the continuum does is try to create a systemic approach and a systemic plan around how they're going to address homelessness and to coordinate the, the resources and services that each program provides. And so in order to do that, they're really looking at creating a shared vision and mission within the community and ensuring that everybody's on the same page about what it is that needs to happen in order to address homelessness. Um, they're then working to develop a community-wide plan. And I will just say, you know, this process is an ever evolving process. And so while communities might have a plan in place, that doesn't mean that it's not available to um, be retooled, to be updated um, as emerging needs are identified. There is typically a centralized decision-making uh, body that is kind of providing the oversight of the process. And that is the executive committee that I mentioned of each of the continuums of care. And that executive committee or another uh, subcommittee that is a smaller subcommittee 
uh, is also responsible for implementation. So there's usually a high level planning group that is really kind of directing the strategies that have been identified and really implementing the plan itself. Within the continuum of care system, there is a goal of really ensuring that there's transparency and understanding of what the eligibility is and how things are being implemented so that everybody is clear how to access services and that there's no secrecy or confusion about how to get into the system. And the continuum and the partners are constantly looking at performance indicators um, setting system-wide performance standards so that they can know whether or not their planning process is effective, and then looking at their data on a regular basis to ensure that uh, they're meeting their goals. Um, so this is, a, as, again, is a cycle where it is a continuous process that the continuums are going through uh, in order to see if they're actually reaching their target of ending homelessness and working with their partners to continue this planning process. Next slide. So within the homeless service system, the continuum of care is really kind of res uh, responsible for overseeing these programs that are available in the system. I like to think of these as three kind of buckets of programs. The first set of programs are really about maintaining people in housing. So prevention and diversion are about helping to uh, support families that are experiencing housing crisis and staying in their housing. Because once they experience homelessness, there's a whole other set of trauma and a whole other set of resources that have to be activated to help get them back into housing. So there's the maintenance piece, which is really about keeping folks where they are in housing as much as possible to keep them safe and stable. The second set of uh, supports and services that are available in the community are more of a crisis response. So this includes your outreach teams, your emergency shelters, and your transitional housing. Uh, these programs really work to ensure that folks are connected um, and that are addressing their immediate crisis needs. Uh, you know, of course, our Maslow's hierarchy of need, we wanna make sure that folks are able to access shelter, food, water, um, their basic needs. Uh, but once they are actually accessing their basic needs, then there needs to be effort and supports to help them move forward into stability and into permanent housing. And that's the last group of, of services that we have listed here, which is the stability uh, services. These are services that are targeted to ensure folks are ending their homelessness and getting them back into housing. Rapid rehousing is a program that provides up to 24 months of rental assistance and support services to families and individuals in existing apartments within the community. Permanent supportive housing is similar to rapid rehousing with supports and rental assistance. However, permanent supportive housing is longer term. So this is uh, really geared towards households that might need supports to remain stable, such as households or individuals that have severe mental illness, substance abuse um, challenges, or physical disabilities, developmental disabilities. And then there's just general permanent housing, really working to help get people connected to housing that is available in the community. While while we know that everybody who is experiencing homelessness, most of the families and individuals that experience homelessness are probably eligible for and appropriate for a rental assistance voucher. The unfortunate reality is that we do not have enough rental assistance vouchers for every single person that needs it. So for many of the people who are exiting homelessness in your system, they're actually exiting to market rate units uh, where they're negotiating lower rents with landlords um, and they're not actually getting the rental assistance or financial support to remain housed. Um, so that has to be factored into how you're going to actually resolve homelessness for the families that are experiencing homelessness, both sheltered and unsheltered. Next slide. So all of those components that I talked about on the previous slide, as I mentioned, there's a lot of need in the community. And one of the things that the continuum of care is required to do is to figure out how to coordinate all of those services and how to streamline the way that um, individuals and families who are experiencing homelessness are accessing those services. Every community has what's called a coordinated assessment process. You might also hear it referred to as coordinated entry in your community. Um, and this is organized at the county level. The goal of coordinated assessment or coordinated entry is to streamline access into system services. It is designed to be a transparent process so that everybody knows how to access services. And it is also designed as a way to really prioritize those who are most vulnerable uh, for, for, for services first. Um, coordinated assessment really acts as kind of a triage as, as what you might see in an emergency department. The number of people who are experiencing homelessness is so great in our state, in our communities, 
Um, and unfortunately, the resources that are available are limited. So what we must do first and what communities are trying to do first is triage those who are most vulnerable to get access to those services first um, with the intention of serving every single person, but those who are most vulnerable being the first on the list to receive supports. Uh, so the coordinated assessment system has four components. The first is that the system is trying to make sure that it is, a, is accessible and it's easy for clients to get connected to. We want to make the process for clients getting into services as easy as possible. And so many communities have a web-based system or a phone-based system. And then there are also communities that have drop-in locations where people can go in to start the process of getting connected to coordinated entry or coordinated assessment. Once folks get connected to that system, the first thing that happens is that they are assessed to understand what their household needs are, to, to define their, uh, their level of vulnerability and to really look at their homeless history. Once that has been determined, households are prioritized with those who are most vulnerable being at the top of the list. Um, this kind of grew out of the idea that we wanna minimize the number of folks who are dying on the street. So um, typically communities are really prioritizing folks who are at most risk of death on the street um, for housing first. Um, and then once folks have been assessed and prioritized, the system, the agencies that are operating coordinated entry or coordinated assessment are referring those households to the appropriate services within the community that most um, effectively meet their needs and also based on the eligibility. So this is a whole process that every community has, every continuum of care has in place to get people connected to housing. And so um, this is something important to keep in mind as you're thinking about how you're going to connect folks who are experiencing unsheltered homelessness in your community to the resources that are available, they need to be tapped into coordinated assessment or coordinated entry. Next slide. So there's a lot that I went through in terms of what the continuum of care is doing and what uh, what ways they are coordinating the resources. The continuum of care is really that body that has, that is kind of overseeing all of the resources and services that are available in the community. And so as you're looking at how you can address unsheltered homelessness, it is really important that you're connecting with the continuum of care so that you can plug folks into the resources and services that are available to address homelessness. Um, first step in that process of connecting with the continuum of care is reaching out to the lead agency, um, letting them know that there is an issue that you are concerned about within your community and that you need to address. Uh, once you've connected with that lead agency, I think the second step that you really should be looking at it from a municipal uh, perspective is that you want to connect with and talk to the executive committee of the COC or the continuum of care. The executive committee is that decision-making body and that body needs to understand and, and know uh, the concerns that you might have at a municipal level. Um, the information that the executive committee has and the ways that they direct their and prioritize their strategies and their services really comes from where they see the needs in the community. And if all of that information is only coming from service providers, then they're going to be skewed to what the service providers are seeing as a need. So it's really important as a municipal leadership that you are engaging with the executive committee of the COC. As will be discussed a little bit more, um, it is also really important when you when it gets down to the actual work of engaging and supporting folks who are unsheltered and in your encampments, you want to make sure that you're engaging with the outreach teams that are doing that work, that are um, working with folks who are unsheltered and connecting them to resources. That outreach team is really going to be the, the conduit through which you can tap into coordinated entry or coordinated assessment in the community. And then finally, if... Uh, if and when and as you are working with your continuums, it might make sense, you know, each community needs to decide for itself what makes the most sense, but it might make sense to participate in the COC, in either the subcommittees or strategic planning sessions or with the executive committee, but to have regular contact with the continuum of care so that you can continue to ensure that uh, those encampments are closed down and remain closed and the folks are safely exited to permanent housing. Next slide. Again, the resources here will be shared, but here's a list of all of the continuums of care in the state. Um, as I mentioned, there are 16 continuums of care. We have 21 counties. It's primarily at a county level. There are two regional ones. So we have the Southern New Jersey continuum, which covers Camden, Gloucester, Cumberland, and Cape May. And then we also have the Tri-County continuum, which covers Warren, Hunterdon, and Sussex. Um, but the contact information for the lead entity, the lead uh, contact for each continuum is listed there along with their website. And again, you want to reach out to that lead contact and then also uh, try to get connected to and meet with the executive committee. 
And finally, last slide, um, here's our contact information at Monarch Housing. We're happy to answer any questions about the process, about um, how to get started in this work, uh, how to think about your local plan at a municipal level in terms of how you are addressing homelessness. And I have my contact information as well as the contacts of our homeless planning team lead aid, uh, partners as well. So thank you. All right, next up, uh, Pam Baker, right, who's going to talk a little bit about what being a lead agency is, what um, what the partnership with municipal government looks like, and uh, really how they approach um, this work. Hey, how are you guys doing? Uh, good afternoon. I hope you all are having a good day. Um, <clears throat> so uh, I'm Pamela Baker. I'm our Deputy Director of Homelessness Services. Um, so that uh, just so you kind of know a little bit more about uh, myself and also our agency here. Um, so collaborative support programs, obviously we use CSP and J, a little shorter for everybody to remember. Um, and we are also a nonprofit. Um, we are primar uh, primarily a mental health agency, um, but we do a variety of uh, substance use and homelessness services, obviously that I'm about to uh, discuss with you all. Um, um, you know, we are also a peer led agency, um, which I want to make sure to kind of mention that because that has a lot to do with how we do our work and uh, what we believe also makes us uh, fairly successful in the way that we are able to engage folks, uh, especially in uh, in encampments. Um, you can go ahead and switch slides. Um, so we uh, we have you know uh, multiple outreach teams that uh, go across the uh, the state. Uh, so we are a statewide agency. So um, we do work with a variety of municipalities, uh, different counties, cities, uh, with the state also here with DCA. As Mike mentioned, um, we are a recipient of some of their IHPS and diversion funds, uh, which were. Uh, extremely helpful when we're trying to get folks uh, quickly exiting their homelessness out of, you know, places like the encampment. Um, so uh, what we'd like to focus on with our teams um, is we like to uh, basically do a ton of training around uh, around things around this so that our teams understand what the our best practices are, um, and which also are mimicked by best practices overall, um, just with outreach and especially with encampment work. Um, so again, outreach should always be intentional, okay? You should always um be a willing uh conversation it should not ever be a, a forceful it doesn't mean because i'm there you have to talk to us um we always want to make sure that that's made clear uh that that folks know that all of our services including talking to us is optional right um it's the only way that you're going to get the best success uh, in our opinion uh, is to have people buy into their own uh, their own challenges right so like we even though we may be there to offer a variety of services even though that person isn't interested you know we're, we're still going to show up every day and we're still going to talk to them um even if it's just saying hello good morning just, just touch and base them right so again it should be should always be intentional it should never be forced um it's not what we think the person needs it's what it's what they think they need and that's always how we work um so we also try to basically build a relationship with the person. That's how we do everything. Everything that we do here at CSP and especially our outreach is all based off of our engagement and also the, the relationship that we build with folks. If you can't build a relationship with folks uh, where they trust you and they believe that you're actually there to help them and do the right thing, um, you're not gonna get very, very far very quickly. Um, and right at that moment, uh, time is of the essence and also how, you know, again, we're, we're there to quickly, hopefully move them on and, and quickly hope them exit the situation that they're in. Um, as we know, clearly, this is all pretty traumatic for folks that are, that are living unhoused in the community. Um, the way we do that is, I'm sure you've heard, obviously, Mike and Taisa tap on it before, but we follow a housing first model. Um, we are a low barrier provider, and that means that we make it as easy as possible for folks to access our services. So um, that's truly meeting people where they're at, both physically, both um, both mentally, wherever, whatever they have going on, that that's that's how we're meeting. OK, so um, that's how we, again, we have shown that we've had the most success. Um, you know, again, the person themselves has to have to have the buy-in. Okay, so that's if that's one thing that I can really stress is that you cannot be forcing your services on folk and your engagement on people. So, um, you know, that low barrier approach, um, making sure people don't have to jump through hoops to get the services from you or from the the providers that are in your area is really key. Um, and that's a big role of what we do is trying to mitigate and help kind of break down some of those barriers for these folks. Um, you can you can switch slides, please. 
Um, so we, we assist everybody, right? So that doesn't mean that we say, oh, this individual is maybe using today, this individual's experience a mental health challenge. And that means we're just gonna, not gonna talk to them. We're not gonna come back. Um, that means that that means we just have to engage in a different way. Maybe that person is not able to have a conversation today, but we're gonna come back tomorrow. Um, you know, we don't ever say no to folks, um, which is how you have to to be in this line of work, okay? You cannot tell folks they have to be sober. You cannot tell folks that they have to be on medication or be in a program to receive services uh, as far as we're concerned, okay? So we don't do any of those things. All a person has to want is to actually be housed or to want some of our services. Um, all, so basically all I have to do is say yes, right? So we try to make it as easy as possible. Again, following that, that low barrier harm reduction approach. Um, there is no um, overpromising. That's a really big, important uh, rule of thumb. Okay, we don't ever want to say, "Hey, we're here today. We're going to get you housed tomorrow." Okay, because we know that that's not realistically how it works. So we really want to make sure that we're focusing on on goals that we can meet with these folks. As Mike mentioned, you know things like birth certificates, IDs. You know, getting folks linked into their social service benefits. Um, uh, employment, whatever it is that they're seeking. You know, that is. Again, we, we want to make sure that we're doing tangible things. So we know that we can get your birth certificate. We know we can get your ID. I don't know that I can get you housed in, in two or three days, okay? But the other things we can. So you want to really be careful not to overpromise things. It, it really is going to hurt your relationship and it's going to make it harder for you to do what you need to do with folks, okay? So they're going to think you are not telling them the truth about the actual process. And that's, again, something you don't ever want to happen. Um, you again want to base everything off that trust and off of the relationship that you have with them. So again, no overpromising is a really, really big one. And it's a common issue that we see all the time um, with folks that have come before us, either other outreach teams, other providers that have worked with these individuals prior to us. Um, we have to do a lot of repairing. So we have to do a lot of, over, you know, a lot of explaining on what we're doing and how the process works because they've been burned by the system so many times that they're a little more reluctant to let us in and start engaging with them. So again, that that trust piece is really, really important and the way that you engage with folks. So um, again, th those are super, super important points just to... If, you remember a few things about today. <laughs> um, okay. So then that means we also never give up on the person. Okay. Just because they told us no one day or because they're not feeling well, does not mean that we're not going to come back and try again over and over and over again. Right. So we'll try until we get to that point with that person that we hopefully can move on to the next step. It may take a lot of time. It may not always feel like the quickest process, but our job is to not stop trying. Okay. So that means again, that we get the most challenging folks that sometimes other providers may have a hard time working with, um, may feel like they are not appropriate because they are too mentally ill or because they still are actively using. Okay, that's not us. Okay, so we, and that's really your engagement style. You really want to consider that because um, again, you want to be the person that they talk to. You want to be the person that they trust, that they tell all their business to, because that's the only way you're really going to be able to help somebody if you know the truth about what's going on. Um, so the other other piece here that's again incredibly important, which I heard Mike touch on a little bit with the engagement with um, reporters and news articles and things like that. You know, we understand that um, especially encampments become ex uh, especially interesting uh, to reporters to the community. You know, there's a lot of discussion, there's a lot of conversations around them, um, especially depending on what municipality you might be in. Um, but communicating with those folks, taking pictures, taking photos, sharing that information with folks that are going to then publish it in the paper is extremely harmful, um, not only to your relationship, but to these folks. OK, so you have to think down the line, not only have now you put their business on full blast, there's now photos of them in the paper, their names are in the paper, other things that, you know, they did not give permission for. OK, so that's a big no, no for us. We do not take photos. We don't take photos for any purpose of any reason. Um, we just we do not see the need for it. Um, we do not share that information, uh, especially publicly, and we do not post things like that on our website because we again do not feel like it's in the best interest of the individuals that we serve. Um, you know, this is not that's not why we're there. Um, and also, again, going back to the harmfulness, you know, when we're trying to house these individuals and we've had this come up where, you know, landlords will run their name, they'll start doing a Google check, they'll look into certain things, and all of a sudden these stories about these encampments that folks used to live in are all of a sudden um are all of a sudden there you know and it hinders people from being housed and sometimes being selected by certain landlords or certain entities because they're able to look them up um unfortunately and see some of their history 
does that make it right? Obviously not. They're still being discriminated against, but just against you get that extra layer of why we think it's really important not to share those type of information and not, not to promote your services in that way. Um, you can go ahead and change slides. Um, so as um, both Teresa and Mike mentioned, also, right, so we like, we love to work actually collaboratively with other partners, with the city, with the counties uh, that we work with, because that way we can enhance what we do um, by connecting into other resources that we're maybe not able to provide or that we can share so things can get done a lot quicker. Um, you know, we, we go through, we systematically create a plan. As Mike mentioned, there's a by name list that we like to use. Typically, we'll remake a list of individuals that are seeking to be placed or that we're working to place out of an encampment. Um, <clears throat> and then we, again, make a plan, we review everything, we talk to the residents about the plan, make sure that they are on board, okay? So that's the most important part. So especially when working in an encampment, you have to remember that this is their home, okay? Um, they're inviting us in, they're allowing us to come in to help them, hopefully, right? So you want to always make sure you respect that, and you want to make sure that they're always in the loop and that they always know what's going on um, with both dates, with closure dates, beginning of, of maybe um, housing dates, application dates, you know, everything needs to be extremely coordinated and not only with the providers, but also with the residents, okay? So um, that's that's a huge, huge important piece because um, the housing plans that we create you know, sometimes involve quite a few steps. So as, as you heard mentioned, you know, connecting to the coordinated assessment in your area. So we will then pair with them, pair with the city or the county there um, who's providing some of that funding. And then, you know, make sure that we really break down that process to the folks at the encampment that we serve so that they have a realistic timeline and that they know exactly what's going on. There's no surprises, right? No one's popping up saying, hey, you're leaving today. And they had no idea. Okay, so the worst thing you can do is hit folks in encampment by surprise. Um, so that kind of leads me into the next thing, right? So you don't want to use that fear factor. You don't want to scare people out of their camps. You don't want to just sweep an encampment off, okay? It's actually extremely harmful um, to the whole campsite, okay? That means people get dispersed uh, without a real plan, without a real place to go. And that means they just go and they find another location to, to start camping. That means us as providers then have to go and find them again in the community, which displaces them, which then stalls our services, which then makes us have to go and find these individuals. And then hopefully we can convince them that we didn't know that they were about to be get thrown off that property because no one alerted us first, which typically is what we try to have happen. Um, we try to Again, mitigate that um, coercion piece. You know, we we do work with law enforcement, but they're um, but it's very again coordinated. Okay, so we go in, we discuss things with them, so that they know if there's police officers coming, so that they know if someone will be on site. Um, we have a very close working relationship um, with NJ Transit, which we utilize them, but they let us lead the you know kind of lead the the direction at first, and then when we need them, then they they will be involved. Um, other municipalities, the same thing. We'll kind of keep them informed. Um, and a lot of times, you know, the police don't necessarily want to be the people who come in and do this enforcement. They want to see the folks get what they need because they also know that it's just going to displace people again, and then they're going to see them somewhere else in the community. So um, again, really having that full coordination, and that means including law enforcement in your conversations. Um, so that way, they don't think that they have to be removing these people, you know, um, especially after grants pass, there's some uh, some municipalities or some locations that, you know, have chosen not to enforce it um, and have chosen to call folks like us and have, you know, allowed us to step in and, and help them get these folks placed or to allow them the time, the proper time to clear their site, to be moved accordingly and to be linked with housing resources, which, again, is really what we, what they need because in reality, the reason that folks are using the encampments is because there's obviously not enough of housing, right? Not enough affordable housing, I should say. That's really what kind of gets to the crux of it. It also has to do with there not being shelters in their locations, um, maybe not being shelters they feel safe in. Maybe there's shelter that are too high barrier, which means that they need to be there at 2 p.m. with their ID and then they get kicked out at six in the morning. You know, sometimes that's not conducive to people's work environment. Um, you know, a large majority of folks in encampments, whether you know it or not, are actually tend to be uh, older, maybe 40, 50, 60s, okay? And then actually a little bit, a little, uh, a little bit higher than that. We've actually been seeing folks in their 70s also out in these camps, um, but they have a lot of medical issues. And I think that's something that also kind of doesn't maybe get talked about a little bit as well. That's good to mention is that they have medical equipment that they have to plug in. Sometimes shelters do not accommodate these types of, of items. So I know it sounds crazy, but they'll be out there and they'll have a generator and then they can live more comfortably 
in their tent than they could in a shelter because ideally it's again it's not made to accommodate folks that have medical challenges that have disabilities that are really you know dealing with folks that have severe mental health and substance use challenges because they tend to be the folks that get kicked out from some of these locations which in turn end them up in locations like encampments um it's you know they're building their own community where they have not been able to find something somewhere else so you know just kind of keep that in mind that you know um they are they are a community within the community. So when you go in and you start talking to these folks, again, you really want to remember that, you know, this this is their home and to always kind of be respectful of that. Um, and as I said before, right, all they need to say is yes. So as soon as they say yes, we start working, okay? That means, um, I, I believe I heard mentioned before, right? So we start working on birth certificates, documents, everything we need to get that person, what we call housing ready. So that therefore, when we link them to coordinated entry, they have all the documents that they need to be accepted into the coordinated entry so that that way they can get on the list to hopefully see if they are eligible from any type of voucher housing that could be open in the community, any other housing provider that maybe has some some open availability, anything with us as far as a like more of a rapid rehousing type option, if that's what the person needs, a little just a little jump start to get into something, right? All of those things you're going to need all those really basic things for. So as soon as they say yes, we line up all those documents and we and basically we get to work, right? So we try to be as quickly and as timely as we possibly can. Um, you could go ahead and switch slides. Um, we uh again so as i kind of mentioned before uh sweeps can be really really harmful so we try to prevent sweeps by again coordinating that coordinating a date and a time that the end of the camp will actually be um be set so that again everybody is notified and most importantly the residents okay um it's all about compromise you don't want to compromise the trust that you have with them so again it's very very important that everything is is very thought out but again everybody is on the same page if there's any change then you go back and you tell them that next day that there's a change in the date even if it's a day an hour anything you, you want to make sure you obviously inform them as best that you can um it has to do with safety, it has to do with make sure people aren't left behind, it has to do with make sure pets, other items aren't discarded that maybe um, they want to come back for, or maybe that there's no one in the actual tent on the day that that tent get that camp gets cleared. There are some municipalities that, uh, you know, uh, not in this state, I don't believe, but um, have uh, have unfortunately picked up individuals in their tents when they've gone to clear camps because they have not been cleared properly. Um, and they came in and, and swept the camp without giving proper notification to the residents that were in it. So, you know, people can be injured, pets can be injured, uh, property is lost and damaged. And obviously, you know, these folks are out there probably keeping the only belongings that they actually have uh, in that tent with them. So again, if they are damaged it's or they're lost, you know, it's really very detrimental to the folks. Uh, and it creates another layer of trauma on top of what they're already experiencing. Um, it also then, again, forces that displacement uh, when there's not an actual real thought out plan um, and that collaboration, which is, again, is key. Um, and then again, we have to find them in community. We have to rebuild all that trust and we have to then hope that they believe us and take that assistance again. Um, you, can, uh, you can go ahead and switch slides again. And also, you know, from a municipality standpoint, you know, there's also, um, you know, uh, cost to talk about, right? So the more you move these folks around and the more that they hop around to different services, the, you know, the less they're able to use the services that are really helpful to them. So by the time they get to some stuff, by the time they figure it out, maybe funding could be ending. Maybe there could have been other funding that they could have been tagged onto. Okay, so again, time is really, really of the essence. Um, so what we try to do is provide really innovative solutions to try to end that homelessness as quick as possible. Um, as I mentioned, I got ahead of myself a little bit, right? But all the ID, documentation, social services, uh, any kind of linkage that they possibly want, we we link them up directly as quickly as possible as we can. Um, we have a lot of services that we do um, internally as an agency. Um, everything from you know we have drop-in centers that they can go ahead and, and we can do all the, this uh, all these processes with, uh, as well as with the outreach team. Um, we also have a respite program where folks can go when they're in crisis up to 10 days just to kind of decompress from their situation. Um, and we also have some housing that you know folks uh, can tap into sometimes as well. Um, that's also a voucher. Um, so, you know, again, trying to offer a variety of, of services to them. Um, I think uh, that's kind of uh, the basics of everything. We're, I think, a little close to time, so I'll, uh, I'll wrap up. But um, again, just I guess one thing if you can remember is just, again, meet people where they're at. And, uh, and again, we're, we're around if anybody would need a hand. <laughs> Thank you guys so much. Okay. Thank you. Again, this is uh, Mike Sarah. 
Uh, I don't see Sierra confirm. I don't see any questions dropped in the in the box yet. No, uh, we so, don't have any at the moment. So if if anyone has any, um, uh, can can I just ask a sort of a general question? To, to and I'll throw it that to anybody. Oh, uh, re really? What what's your first step? If you know, particularly, I, th I think you have some some communities and your know, municipalities. Who maybe have not had this issue, and uh, it, it, it historically, and are facing it maybe you know, maybe for the first time, or maybe not if not for the first time, but maybe at a level that they have not seen before. Uh, so when when you, when you face a challenge like that, really, yo, know, what's your recommendation for the first phone call to be made? Sure. So I I can tell you from the state's perspective. Um, we would like you to call us at the Office of Homelessness Prevention, um, particularly because we have a lot of additional resources that both buoy and support the existing COC infrastructure, right, that we can leverage to bear, but also to, to um, you know, enhance what's going on as an ad, as an as needed basis. Similarly, um, one of the things that we do is we, we, bring in not only ourselves from the state, but also local government services, right? Obviously with uh, with the commissioner still being the director there. That also in, let, let, let some enhancements do ha happen around the planning process, but then we bring in the continuums. We bring in Thais's team, we bring in Pam's team, right? So that it's essentially a canned process that we can then collaboratively engage in to go through the process that we just, just, just described through that process map. So I say, the best first step, right, is to reach out to my office, right? I'll uh, I'll drop my, it's either ohp at dca.nj.gov, right, or my email. Um, and then, you know, Taisa and Pam definitely hop in too. And I'll, I'll just quickly echo, I think, um, you know, the easiest is probably contacting Mike's office, but as a second step, you know, bringing in the continuum partners, because a lot of the services, the resources, the housing supports that you're going to need to help exit people into housing um, is going to come through the continuum um, or is coordinated through the continuum. So they do need to be at the table. Um, but I think as a first step, Mike's office is probably the easiest way to get started in that process. Yeah, I would kind of obviously piggyback off of that as well, because I'm most likely going to reach out to all of those folks because I'm going to be building all the resources and connecting all the dots. So we're all going to kind of talk uh, regardless. But, you know, obviously Mike would be probably, you know, be the one to kind of connect us the quickest, I would say. And, and like, see, to, just, just importantly, yeah, to, sure, just like we don't have a standard state, like three week return time. Like we'll get back to you within 24 hours. So <laughs> <laughs> that's good to know. Uh, and I see, uh, thank you. I, I see you put your email address in a, a sort of a general, uh, I guess a general email address for, for your office and Thaisa put, put, uh, dropped it in. And I, and I know uh, Pam's uh, contact information was in the PowerPoint. Uh, so it'll be part of the, of the presentations that's posted online. And I see somebody posted something uh, sort of on the line of uh, very, very, you know, very new to our municipality. So a lot of information was presented. Uh, any questions before we wrap this up? We are over an hour, so we, we try to be respectful of uh, the, the lunch hour. Uh, if not, Michael, Thaisa, Pam, thank you uh, for, for your time. I very much appreciate it. Some very useful information. And uh, it's good It's good to know that, that the resources are out there uh, for, for, for communities. So, um, Thank you all. Uh, this will be posted uh, on, on our website within 24 hours. And uh, of course, if anyone has, needs any follow-up, uh, you have the contact information as well. So with that, uh, it looks like it's a nice day outside. So uh, maybe, maybe after sitting in front of our computer screens, we all should go out and get some fresh air and, uh, <laughs> and, then, and then get back to work. Uh, so thank you all. Uh, have a great day. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye-bye. Sure.